Hey folks, welcome to another set of 8th grade science video notes. In our second lesson of Unit 1 today, we're going to learn about engineering. Through this video lesson, a project, and all of our labs throughout the year, we'll cover these four standards. Let's get started. First, let's get some basic terminology down. Some of these are on your cutouts for this lesson, and some are not. Be sure to write down any definitions that aren't included on those cutouts, as well as the examples that I give for criteria and constraints. It'd probably be helpful for you to know what engineering is. Engineering is the scientific process of creating, building, designing, and or modifying objects or processes in order to solve a problem. Anytime we're creating something new or modifying an existing object or process, we're engineering. Ideally, the result of the engineering process is a better product. You'll often hear the word design when talking about engineering. A design is really just the plan for what you are engineering. So the engineering process helps to get you to a design that you can then implement to make the changes you're hoping to make. Your design will usually be given a set of criteria and constraints. Criteria are the requirements or goals that your design must meet in order to be considered successful. If your design doesn't do what you're trying to make it do, it's not a successful design. Constraints are the limitations that are placed on your design. In other words, your design has to fit within some specific set of rules in order to even be considered as a viable design. Things like the material the product's made out of, the total cost of the product, or the required dimensions of the product are examples of constraints. Our junior high robotics team builds a new robot each year. Two of the usual criteria for the robot that they build is that it has to be able to pick up and manipulate or move some type of game pieces on the playing field. If it can't pick up the game piece, or it can't shoot it, move it, or flip it where we want to put that game piece, it has not met the criteria and cannot be considered a successful design. The constraints for the robot are that we can only use six motors, we have to use a specific brand of pieces, and it can't be longer, wider, or taller than the rule book says for that year. If we don't fit within those constraints, we can't even use the robot in a competition. Finally, a prototype is a working model of your design, usually built with cheaper materials. For the junior high robotics team, we'll often build different arms, intakes, or shooters without building them directly on the robot first, just to test out the design to see if it'll work. Often, a prototype is used as a proof of concept or a way to prove that the design does what it's supposed to do, mechanically, before you spend all the time and money to build it for real. The engineering design process consists of multiple steps, not always in an exact order. You've got a copy of the chart to the right to glue into your notebook. Be sure to write the correct names of the steps in the blanks. Before you can really start the engineering design process, you have to define what your problem is. If you don't know what problem you're trying to solve, you don't have a direction to go with in your design process. Then, you probably want to identify any criteria and constraints that your design will have. What do you need for your design to be successful, and what are your limitations? Once you know the problem, your criteria, and your constraints, you can start brainstorming ideas that might work. This is often a team effort. You then gather all of those ideas together, sift through them, and select the one or ones that seem to be the most promising. Next, you can start building prototypes of those ideas that you selected. Then, you test the prototypes to see if they work. This is where the process becomes a bit circular. We don't have to go clear back to the beginning, trying to define the problem, but after you test your prototypes, you'll evaluate them to decide if they meet the criteria or goals you were shooting for, and if they don't, or you can find a better way to do it, you modify or iterate your design, change the prototype a bit, test it again, and evaluate it again. You keep repeating those three steps, test, evaluate, modify, until you come up with a high quality solution that you can then incorporate into your actual design. Your last step is to communicate that solution to others. Maybe you're just working on the arm of a humanoid robot, but someone else is working on its body. You have to communicate what your arm looks like, how it works, and how it would attach to the robot's torso so that the person working on the body can make sure that they'll work together. Communication is very important in all aspects of science because you have to be able to tell others the science that you're doing. At this point, if you want a couple of extra points because you're actually listening to the video instead of just watching it without sound, draw the best gear you can draw on the top right corner of the page that you're on. Some engineering projects take centuries of design and modification 
in order to land to a really good spot. For example, the modern toilet system that we all know and love today. Originally, way back in the 11th century, people's idea of a quality toilet was an extra little space built on the side of a wall with a hole in it. You'd drop your waist down that hole and it would go directly out onto the street below. Not exactly the most sanitary solution, but it's what they had at the time. A hundred years later or so, the Christ Church Monastery designed a unique plumbing system that would separate the rainwater, wastewater, and running water from each other. This was significantly a more sanitary system. In the 1400s, the normal way to dispose of your waste was into a chamber pot, which is kind of like a bedpan you see at the hospital, or a toddler's potty training chair. You'd have to take it out and dump it in a specific place whenever it got full. In the late 1500s, Sir John Harrington created the first flushable toilet design, but it didn't take off and it was several years later before we actually started using his design. In the 1700s, when our country was being founded, they used a privy midden, which was basically a wooden bench with holes in it that dropped your waste into a hole in the ground. And that hole had to be emptied every so often, kind of like a modern day porta potty. You can also think of it like an outhouse. In the 1800s, many were still using chamber pots, but to make it a little less gross, they built a wooden thunder box around it. Kind of like the pretty tissue box covers that we have today that cover up our cardboard boxes of tissues and make them look a little bit fancier. This was easier to clean than a privy midden and was a little bit more concealed than an open chamber pot. In the mid-1800s, the design of the dry earth closet started to become popular. It wasn't too dissimilar from the earlier designs, but it would collect the waste in such a way that you could move it somewhere else, dry it out, and use it as a compost or fertilizer. Interestingly enough, many water treatment plants today will take up your solid waste, they call it sludge, burn off the methane that's produced by it as it decomposes, then take that dry, solid waste and let farmers use it for fertilizer. In the 1800s, Alexander Cummings invented the S-shaped trap, which we still use in toilets today. Its design allowed any odorous gases to be trapped in the plumbing, as some amount of the water always sealed it off around the downward curve of the S-trap. In the early 1900s, we'd create water pressure by putting water in a tank that was placed high above the toilet. To flush it, you'd pull on a chain. It would release the water, and it would flow down into the plumbing system. This is very similar to our modern-day tank toilets, but since we hadn't figured out an easier way to get that water pressure built up yet, we had to put the tank up high to get gravity's help. Finally, in the mid-1900s, the flushometer was created, which avoids the whole tank system altogether and hooks the toilet up directly to pressurized water. This is just like the toilets we have in school today. As you can see, the engineering design process is an ongoing process, as a design can always be improved upon. However, after a lot of hard work and determination, you can get to a design that is pretty good and may not need any modifications for a while. Well, that's all for today, folks. I hope you paid attention really well and that this video helps you understand some of the basics of the engineering design process. As always, if you have any questions, let me know.